Good morning and welcome to our service here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. If you're able to join with us this morning across the internet, you are indeed most welcome. We'll turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for every joy and mercy, every blessing and kindness that you send into our lives. We realize and recognize that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights above. And we know, O oh God, how kind you are. Help us to be glad and to be grateful this morning as we meet in your holy presence and grant that we may further know your presence and your blessing, that you would visit us in the power of your Holy Spirit and have dealings with us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to read the words of a hymn, number seven. Eternal light, eternal light, how pure the soul must be. When placed within your searching sight, it shrinks not, but with calm delight can face such majesty. The spirits who surround your throne may bear the burning bliss, but that is surely theirs alone, since they have never, never known a fallen world like this. Oh, how shall I, whose native sphere is dark, whose mind is dim, before the face of God appear, and on my naked spirit bear the uncreated beam. There is a way for man to rise to that sublime abode, an offering and a sacrifice, the Holy Spirit's energies and advocate with God. Such grace prepares us for the sight of holiness above. The sons of ignorance and night may dwell in the eternal light through the eternal love. How wonderful to know of salvation prepared for us in that wonderful sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So welcome everybody to the children's talk today. I'm afraid there are not so many of us today because I think everybody's gone on holiday, but the faithful ones are here and we're very glad to see you. And at least two of them are having their lunch and Daniel is drinking something. I'm not sure what it is, but it looks like chocolate to me. But I, I don't know if that's really what it is. But anyway, there we are. We're all getting something to eat. So that's that's really good. We've been thinking about the Bible and the Bible is God's book. That's the point. It's different from all the other books in the world because the Bible is God's book, isn't it? And it's so much more important and Though you can enjoy many other books, the Bible is the book that you really need to hear from. You need to, to read. The book of Genesis tells us how everything started, how the world, the sun, the moon, the stars started. God made them. The book of Exodus tells us that God rescued man, rescued the Jewish people from sin, from Egypt, but from sin. He rescues us too. The book of Leviticus tells us that God is holy. Numbers tells us that God's people, though God was so kind to them, wandered. Deuteronomy is, you know, uh, Moses saying to the younger generation, you need to be careful to listen to God. It's followed by Joshua. And they did listen to God. But in Judges, they didn't listen to God. I hope you listen to God. Don't you, Samuel? Do you listen? Do you listen to what God says? I hope so. Well, there's Judges, there's Ruth, the story of a little family who started off, they were not listening to God. And then the story of Samuel. And Samuel, of course, means heard of God. And it tells us the story of a young man who does come to listen to God, to hear God. But when he gets older, the children of Israel don't want his sons and they don't really want God and they want a king and they choose a man called, what was his name? What was the name of the man they chose? Saul. Saul, that's right. And he turned out to be a bad man. But he's followed by a good king. Yep, followed by a good king and his name is David. And last time we thought about how we talked, remember, how about David and, and the Philistines and the giant? His name was Goliath. But last time we talked about how David was concerned that God's, what was it? The Ark of the Covenant, that box, remember? The one with the gold lid. How God should be amidst his people. 
Now, this morning, I want to talk about Solomon. And Solomon was David's son. And he would become the king after David. Solomon's a very lovely name. I don't know if you know what it means. Do you know what Solomon means? Solomon means peace. It means peace. So that's a very nice name, isn't it? My name is Stephen, and that means a crown. A crown. Solomon, well, it means peace. So it's a very lovely name. It means peace. Well, um, in Solomon's day, the children of Israel knew a great deal of peace. And so his name really was quite fitting because they, they knew days, not so much of war, but of peace. And that was wonderful. When Solomon was becoming the king, David gave him some advice. He told him some things, some very important things to listen to. And, you know, Solomon listened to what his father said. Samuel, do you always listen to what mummy and daddy say? Hmm? Do you always listen? Uh-huh. You do? That's very good. And so if mummy or daddy say something, you listen to them, and you do what you're told? You do? That's okay. James, do you, do you always listen to what mummy and daddy say? Is that what you do? He's hiding. Hey, he's hiding. Daniel, do you always listen to what your dad says? Yes. Do you always do what your dad says? Most of the time. Most of the time. Very good. Well, it's most important to listen to what mummy and daddy say, isn't it? It's very important to listen to what mummy and daddy say. And that's what Solomon did. He listened to his father, David. Anyway, he became the king. And the Bible tells us that he loved the Lord. And that's very, very important, to love the Lord. And he loved the Lord just like his father, David. He loved the Lord. The Bible tells us that. It wasn't that he was saying it. The Bible tells us that he loved the Lord. And he went to worship God at a place called Gibeon. And he was making sacrifices at Gibeon. And whilst he was there at Gibeon, God came to him in a dream. Now, did anybody have a dream last night? Did you have a dream? Anybody have a dream last night? No? James, no dream last night? Does anybody like having a dream? Hmm? I'm not sure if I like having a dream. Sometimes dreams can be nice, but sometimes when you wake up from a dream, you're all a bit shaken up and you're a bit scared. Hmm? Well, anyway, in this dream, God was speaking to Solomon. And it wasn't just a dream as we have a dream. This was God speaking to Solomon. And God said to Solomon, ask, what shall I give you? Now imagine that. Imagine being asked, whatever you want to have, you can have it. What would you ask for, Daniel? Suppose your dad said, Daniel, whatever you want, you can have. Hmm? What would you ask for? He's, he's stroking his chin like this. He's thinking what the answer might be. What are you going to go for? Um, I don't know. You don't know. Samuel, suppose mummy or daddy said to you, you can have whatever you want. What would you go for? Hmm? Is there anything you'd like to have? What would you like to have? Mm. Mm. James, anything you would like to have? Not sure. Oh, hang on but a minute. Samuel says, yes, I can tell you what I'd like to have. What would you like to have? What would you like? Oh, his head's hey, falling. Chris. Oh, oh, you like the crisps. Okay, that's all right. Hey, Chris. Lovely. They look very nice. I wish I could have one too. Okay. Well, you know, when Solomon heard God say that, he said 
something quite amazing to God. This is what he said. I'm going to read it because I want to get it exactly right. This is what Solomon said. He said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of David, but I am but a little child. I wonder what he meant by that. He was a man, he wasn't a little child. Why do you think he said that? He was a man, you see, he wasn't a little child. Do you like to think of yourself as a little child? Or do you think you're getting a bit bigger? Uncle Stephen? Yes? Are you a little boy, Samuel, or are you getting a bit bigger now? Are you a big boy or are you a big boy? Hmm? I'm a big boy. I'm a big boy. James, is a, a little boy or a bigger boy? Getting a bit bigger? Is that right? Watch this. Getting a bit bigger? Stop. What about you, Daniel? Are you a little boy? Would you, would you say of yourself, I am but a little child? No. No, you wouldn't say that. Would you say that, James? I am but a little child? Would you say that? I don't think so. You'd want to say, I'm getting to be a big boy now. I'm getting to be a big boy. Well, Solomon said, I am but a little child. And this is what I want. I want to be wise so that I can rule over your people because I'm going to be the king. But I want to rule over your people really well. And I want to be wise and I need you to give me wisdom. And you know, God was very, very pleased with his answer because he wasn't asking for something for himself. He was asking for something for God's people and for God's glory. And wasn't that wonderful? I have no... And God no gave him wisdom. God made him wise. Now, the Bible immediately tells us how we can see that Solomon was so wise. Because one day, two women came to see Solomon. And these two women had two babies, one baby each, okay? They were both baby boys. So we're all boys today, so that's okay. They were both baby boys. And it seems that one of the babies had died. Now, how do you think the mummy whose baby had died felt? Was she happy? No, she wasn't happy, was she? She wasn't happy. She was... She was sad. She was sad, yeah. And actually, she was a bit angry. Because both these mummies came and they said, This is my baby! You see this baby that's living? This is my baby. Yeah. Now, one was telling the truth and one was telling... A lie. A lie. lie. Yeah. One was telling the truth and another was telling a lie. But Solomon didn't know. How was he going to know who was telling the truth and who was telling a lie? So do you know what Solomon said? Solomon said, well, take the baby and we'll cut it in half. Oh no. Imagine that, what do you think about that? We'll cut the baby in two, and this mummy can have half a baby, and that mummy can have half a baby. What about that? Eh? No. No? no. That, that sounds awful, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound awful? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? The mummy whose baby it was, she said, no, no, let, let the other lady have the baby, because she didn't want her baby to die. But the other woman was willing to let the baby die. She was just angry, you see. So Solomon knew immediately who the real mother was. You see, God had made him wise. He wasn't really going to cut the baby in two. But he quickly found out who the real mother was and she wanted the baby to live. Even though she didn't have the baby, she wanted the baby to live. 
You see, God made Solomon wise. And Solomon would be wise, a very wise king indeed. And we need to be wise too. And the only way we can be wise at the end of the day is to listen to God. Now, it's good to listen to mummy and daddy. And, you know, Solomon listened to his father. So that's a good thing to do. It's good to be, you know, listening to mummy and daddy because that they'll help us to be wise. But even more important than that is to listen to God. And we listen to God when we listen to what God says in his word. That's where we really get to be wise. We need wisdom, not that comes from our own hearts, but the Bible talks about wisdom that comes down from heaven above. And that's the kind of wisdom that we need. The people out there think they're very clever. The world thinks it's very clever, but they're not so very clever. But we can be wise if we listen to God. And wisest of all, if we rest and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. So it's great to be with you for the children's talk this week. And I hope you'll think about um, that lesson concerning Solomon and how he was wise. But it's great to see you. Great to see that lunch has been had. I don't know. Have you had lunch yet, Daniel? Um, I'm eating it now. You're going to get it any now, at any time now. That's great. Okay. Enjoy lunch. I'm going for mine too. And lovely to see you. Hope to see you soon. And goodbye. Bye. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye bye. 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 We're going to read God's word this morning in the book of Titus and in chapter two. We've been looking into the book of Titus for some weeks now. And in Titus and chapter two, I'm simply going to read that chapter this morning. Let us hear God's word. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men may be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing to evil to sorry sorry having nothing evil to say of you exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters to be well pleasing in all things not answering back not pilfering but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of god our savior in all things for the grace of god that brings salvation has appeared to unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, Let no one despise you. And we thank God for the reading of his word. We're going to turn then to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God and our loving Father in heaven, we bow in your most holy presence. We acknowledge immediately how much we need your grace and mercy, how much we need your forgiveness and your pardon. For we are a sinful people. We are a people, O God, Um, wayward by our very being and existence. We know that man, Adam, was made in righteousness and in holiness and fully in the image of God, but he fell into sin. We're found fallen in sin. And we, O God, are those who so easily discredit you, 
who fail you, who disappoint you. It's our prayer to you there this evening that you would remember us and that you would reach out to us. And we acknowledge, O oh God, that we deserve nothing but your wrath, nothing but your judgment. But you're a God of great grace and great mercy, of great love, of wonderful compassion. And we thank you that we can turn to you in the full and certain knowledge that there is forgiveness with you, that you should be feared. So help us, we pray this morning, that we may realise and recognise our sin and that we may bow, O oh God, in a great sense of need in your holy presence, knowing that we need pardon, we need forgiveness, and looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom alone that forgiveness can come about. We thank you for the many mercies of the week that is past, and we thank you, Heavenly Father, for every blessing that has been upon our lives. We pray that you would remember us again with more mercies, more blessings, and that we may know your further um, grace, Father in heaven, in our lives day by day. We do thank you for answers to prayer. We do pray for loved ones and dear and precious ones, and especially, Lord, those who are just not so well at this time. We pray, draw near to them and lift them up and help them, Heavenly Father, that though they have known difficult days, yet that they may know something of the joy of the Lord to be their strength. If it please you, O God, to restore them to the fullness of health and strength again, we commend them to your keeping care. We pray that you would remember us uh, there today with your word. And it's not just for ourselves we pray, we pray for our sister congregations, and even wider than that, we pray for every place, O God, where your word is handled carefully and with truth and with a concern for your glory and honour, and where your people live in the fear of God. Meet with them, we pray, this day, and grant, O oh God, that they may know those mercies from heaven as they seek to meet into the presence of God. We pray that you would be pleased, Heavenly Father, to remember different activities that will take place at this time of the year amongst young people. And we pray your blessing upon those many activities. We realise that we're somewhat restrained, but, O oh God, we commit these things into your keeping care. We pray that you would be pleased to remember to the end of the earth efforts that will be made to spread the gospel here and there and your church meeting in many, many different lands and in many, many different situations. Remember, we pray. Remember us, O oh God, with the virus in our land, for our government, but for the many governments of the world facing great trouble. And we uh, realise, Heavenly Father, how much we need help from above. We recognise, O oh God, that what has come has come upon us in judgment, but we pray that in wrath you would remember mercy and that you would reach out to us, that you would remember, O oh God, that we are indeed your creatures and that you would be kind to us. We pray that you would turn the hearts of many who uh, simply fly in the face of God. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that this, this awful thing that has come may make men uh, think carefully. We pray that you would give us your every grace for our lives, whether young people and um, wondering about our education, whether older in years and, and, and wondering about work and how work is going to, 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 to be in, in days to come for those who are at home, Heavenly Father, and perhaps not able to be out as much as they would want to be because of the current uh, plight. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give them your every help and blessing and grace. And we thank you that we can turn these many, many situations of life over to you, knowing that you do all things well. We don't understand the virus. We don't understand the whys and wherefores, O oh God. But we know that God does all things well. And we know and we can affirm with the psalm writer, truly God is good to Israel. So grant us, we pray, to rest and trust in you. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who indwells our hearts. And may he change us from glory to glory as unto the image of the Lord. Forgive us, Lord, that so easily we veer away from the words of God and write the word upon our hearts, we pray, that we may love you and serve you and honour you in our lives. Do come to us this morning with your word and speak to us and again this evening and grant, O oh God, that we may know your help and blessing and grace and mercy and afford us these blessings for the sake of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We've read a hymn. We're going to read from a psalm. And it's just part of Psalm 119 from verse 81. So Psalm 119 and at verse 81. My soul for your salvation yearns and faints. But I have set my hope upon your word. I'm weary looking for your promises. I say, when will you comfort me, O Lord? I'm shriveled like a wineskin in the smoke. Yet I do not forget all your decrees. O how much longer must your servant wait? When will you punish all my enemies? The proud have hidden pitfalls in my way. Their mind is fixed against your holy laws. All your commands remain forever sure. Lord, help me, for they hound me without cause. They almost wiped your servant from the earth, but your commandments I did not betray. Preserve my life according to your love. The statutes of your mouth I will obey. Now we've begun to look into the book of Titus. It's not a terribly long book. Paul is writing to Titus who would seem to be, and we'll see that this morning, a younger man. And he is there in Crete, and Paul has left him in Crete to try and um, sort out, perhaps that's too strong, but certainly to settle the churches in Crete. Titus is to see to it that there is proper leadership in the churches in terms of elders. And um, he's to, to bring God's word. And we've seen that when Paul writes to him, he's not writing sort of a dear Titus Um, letter with advice he's writing as an apostle of Jesus Christ and Titus was to be careful to receive Paul's words and we're to be careful to receive his words too. Titus is to set forth the faith it's a faith really that's once delivered to the saints and we've seen in chapter 2 that faith then applied um, to a number of different groupings to older men last time to older women and this morning Um, In uh, verse 6, we read, Likewise, exhort the younger men to be sober-minded. We're not rushing this book, and I'm not rushing these sections in Titus and chapter 2 for an important reason. We need to feel the power of what we have here. And especially so because our mother tongue is not the Greek language that these words are first written in. These words do need to be teased out if we're truly going to grasp and feel the force of what Paul is saying here. So we've looked at the older men. We've looked at the older women. Um, We saw last time that uh, concern uh, for their God-honoring behavior and the negatives, that they be not slanderous, that they they be not given to, to wine, but rather that as older women, they be good examples in terms of um, teaching, exampling younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, and a whole series then of Christian virtues that follow. But this morning, as I say, we come to verse 6. We're going to look from verse 6 down to verse 8 this morning, and we're going to be thinking about the younger men. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. We're going to use three headings there this morning. First of all, the responsibility of every Christian. The responsibility of every Christian. We're going to be thinking about the young men, but I want to emphasize that every Christian has a responsibility before God. The rally cry for every compliance. And Titus is um, being told to teach, but to set an example that really will be a rally cry for everyone to follow, for every compliance to God's uh, holiness and righteousness. And then thirdly, the rebuttal, the rebuttal to every criticism. For uh, doubtless the Christian will face all kinds of criticism, and perhaps Titus as a minister of God's word in particular 
but his behavior, the way he carries himself, the way he carries on his ministry, his words are to be a rebuttal to every criticism. They're to stop every mouth and leave no one with the opportunity to validly, fairly criticize. Those three headings then, the responsibility of every Christian, the rally cry for every compliance, the rebuttal to every criticism. Let's speak first of all of the responsibility of every Christian. Now, we've seen this important theme of Paul's letter to Titus, that he's writing, that he's ministering, the truth that in um, chapter 1 and verse 1 is according to godliness. Um, Christian truth, gospel truth, um, it's not that's it then, your sins are forgiven, live as you please. No, not at all. It's the truth according to godliness. We need to be careful about that, don't we? Christian truth, gospel truth. It's not, you see, um, simply that the gospel means that my sins are forgiven and now it doesn't matter anymore and I can live as I please. No, not at all. That's the point, really, that Paul is making in this book. It's rather that um, the truth accords with godliness. The wonderful gospel truth matches up with godliness. It's, it's not at odds with godliness. It doesn't uh, leave a carelessness to godliness. It accords with godliness. It's according to godliness. It goes, a, goes along with, it's matched by. And um, as we've seen, and we'll see it again there this morning, it's authenticated by godliness. And we've seen then that the truth of the gospel, um, in terms of its truth, but in terms of the way that it is to garrison the heart, to, to, to grab hold, if you like, um, to guard the Christian's heart, that truth of the gospel is to seep into every heart. We made that point there um, towards the end of last Sunday morning. And we used um, that... I suppose, negative picture um, of the damaged oil tank. And the oil tank is damaged and the oil is seeping into the soil below. And if we can turn that into a positive illustration then, God's truth, the gospel truth, is to seep into the soil of our hearts. It's to permeate. It's to take hold of. It's to take control of every aspect of the Christian's life and demeanor. We've often referred to the book of Leviticus, and the book of Leviticus, of course, sets before us God's holiness, and we've said that a number of times with the children in the children's talk. But it sets out for us that fussy ceremonial law. And sometimes when we read that book of Leviticus, we can be left wondering, asking the question, well, why was God so concerned about this? Or why was God so concerned about that? And it seems to, to, to show a concern over issues that we could really wonder why. Well, part of the reason for, for that, of course, was to drive um, people um, into the arms of uh, really the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and a sense of their need for forgiveness provided in the sacrifices, but all of which pointed to Jesus. But part of the reason um, for that fussiness, if you like, is to set forth before um, the, the, the believer that God has a hold, God demands a hold on every part of our lives. And so, and we sort of said this last time, it's every aspect. Every aspect, every aspect of the Christian's life, God demands. But it's every Christian. And so we've seen in the last few weeks, it's the older men. It's the older women. And now we're told it's the younger men. If you're a Christian, the gospel is, the gospel um, will change you. It is new life, new lifestyle. 
The gospel doesn't leave you where you were with forgiveness. That's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't leave you where you were with forgiveness. No, it brings forgiveness wonderfully, but it brings change and it brings about a change of life. Think of the words of Psalm 130 in verse four. There is forgiveness with thee that thou shouldest be feared. There is forgiveness with thee that thou shouldest be feared. And wonderful to, to think and to ponder as that psalm is pondering the forgiveness that comes from God. But it's, it's not um, forgiveness that we can sort of have a, a free spend and, and do as we wish. No, it's forgiveness that we can learn the lessons of grace and mercy and that we can be found then in the fear of God. Notice again this morning that word likewise. Now we pondered this last Sunday morning. Likewise, exhort the younger men to be sober minded. The word is there in verse six. It was there in reference to the uh, older women in verse three. Likewise, we stressed uh, the point there last Sunday morning that Paul is being perfectly even. Um, because someone is young, or because someone is old, or because someone is a, 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 a male, or because someone is a female, doesn't excuse them from the right response to the gospel of truth and power. Godly responsibilities apply to all members of the Christian community. Now, Paul is um, sort of uh, selecting out the, the older men, the older women, the younger men, but it's not because he's in any sense setting a, a different standard. He's not saying, well, the older men, they need to reach a certain standard. And, uh, no, what he's doing here isn't he's, he's recognizing that um, there are perhaps certain sins, temptations that come to a, an older man. And, and, and with that, certain expectations that we ought to expect from an older man who has learned over the years. Um, and, and these expectations are to, to be um, met. Uh, and that covers, you know, whether it's young or old or male or female. There are godly responsibilities that apply to all members of the Christian community. Notice that Titus is to exhort, likewise exhort the young men to be sober minded. The um, word there for exhort is uh, the, the word that is used in John's gospel. There it's the noun, the comforter of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's what the comforter does. He comforts or he counsels. He comes alongside the Greek word parakaleo. Um, para to come um, to, you know, to alongside and kaleo to call. He calls alongside. And so the word here, um, having the sense of to exhort or to urge. Titus is to counsel, he's to, to urge, he's to exhort gospel obedience from every heart. Now, I'm not going to spend time this morning um, looking at the details of where that word parakaleo is to be found, but in the version that we're uh, reading from, the New King James Version, you can find it, um, the, the verb now translating that, that uh, Greek verb, you can find it translated as beg or pray or implore or encourage or plead or appeal or beseech. All of those words are used to translate um, this word in, in different places in the New Testament. Titus is to urge Christians. He's to exhort Christians. He's to pray um, in the sense of urging. He's to um, ex exhort, he's to encourage, he's to implore all of those words um, that Christians live up to their responsibilities. And notice that chief in Paul's list here then this morning um, for the young men is that word, um, and we sort of met it already in verse two, the word sophroneo. We saw it in verse two of the older um, men there in terms of being temperate, the older men be uh, sober, reverent, 
temperate, there's the word, but it's the adjective. Um, and again, in reference to the older women in verse 5, where it's translated as to be discreet. Here, it's the verb. Now, the fact that it's the verb may well um, imply that for younger ones, this is something they're going to have to work at. It's to be found as a characteristic in older men. It's to be found as a characteristic in older women. And Titus to, is to, to, to urge younger men that they move in this direction. This is something they're going to have to work at. They needed to be self-controlled. They needed to be controlled. That's the word as we've met it twice already. And here it is a third time this morning. That in itself says something to us, doesn't it? That God um, expects that those who are under the power of his Holy Spirit, that they learn self-control. They needed, you see, to be under the control of God, the Spirit. And I've drawn already twice from this, and I'm not, I'm not going to in any sense apologize for drawing from it again. For here we are in Galatians 5 and at verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Where God the Spirit is active, where God the Spirit is beginning to control, he brings about a self-control. He brings about a situation where the life comes to be controlled it's under his control where a person recognizes the wrongness of sin the importance of righteousness and where in the power of the spirit they live out their lives for God the word is used in Luke's gospel chapter 8 verse 35 then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. He is the, 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 the demon-possessed man, and he'd been in such a sorry state and tossed here, there, and everywhere. What a sorry state the man had been in. But when God broke into his life, when the power of God was unveiled in his life, he's brought into his right mind. That's what it means to be under self-control it means to be in your right mind under the power of the spirit now not under the power of evil spirits you find the word again in romans in chapter 12 verse 3 for i say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly as god has dealt to each one a measure of faith to think soberly you see and there's a great emphasis here for the older men for the older women and now for the younger men on self-control the self-control that god the spirit brings now think about that in reference to our own day because the order of the day um, seems to be almost do whatever comes into your head so whatever you know crazy thought Whatever crazy impulse, whatever it is that comes into your head, somehow because it's come into your head, somehow because it's come from your deep inner self or whatever, but because it's come into your head, somehow that sort of makes it right. Somehow if it comes into your head, it's right. No matter how crazed it be, how, no matter how wrong it be, because it's somehow popped into your head, that seems to be the order of the day, doesn't it? Anything is excused. But that's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't make us irresponsible. Not at all. The gospel makes us responsible. Responsible to God. It gives us a sense of our answerability to God. It doesn't in any way take away from the importance of God's law. Rather, it magnifies to our hearts how important um, God's law is. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation day and night. The responsibility of every Christian. But then what I've called the rally cry 
for every compliance. Titus is to urge younger men, but how principally is to do that? Is he to do that rather? And the answer is, first and foremost, yes, he's to preach. And we've already seen that emphasis, and we'll see it again in verse 15, right at the end of the chapter. Um, first and foremost, yes, Titus is to preach. He's a preacher. He's been set apart by God to preach the word. He's been told, speak the things which are important for sound doctrine. He will be told, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Yes, first and foremost, he is to preach. And that's so important, of course, the preaching of God's word. We set great, great score by that. But even before that, and certainly in that, uh, Paul seems to be saying that he's to show himself an example to follow. Look at verse 7. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Now, we've touched on this principle already in relation to the elders in chapter 1. There's a, a glimpse of that last Sunday morning in reference to the older women. The elders are, um, you know, primarily to be an example. Their pattern, their way should show others, without a word really, it should show others the way to go, the way to be. And we saw um, something of a glimpse of that in the older women there last week. But here it is now very much full on in reference to Titus himself. Titus, first and foremost, was to set an example. He's to be a pattern of good works. We know that the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees liked um, very much to look the part. They seemed very much to have wanted to be thought of as the spiritual people. And they wanted others to, to look up to them. They wanted to control people and to tell them what to do. That's the tragedy, isn't it? They wanted to be in control. They, they wanted to be the leaders. They wanted others to follow them. But it was very much in terms of controlling people and telling them what to do. The tragedy is they didn't set a good and godly example to follow. Remember the words, um, of Matthew's Gospel in chapter uh, 23, where the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, very close now to going to the cross at Calvary. And he's entered Jerusalem, and he's already had a number of contentions with different ones there. And then he spends um, what is in Matthew's Gospel, a whole chapter, speaking about really the awfulness of the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, Matthew 23, verse 2. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not according to their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their philosophies broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. That seems to have been their game. They wanted to be looked up to. They wanted to be thought important. They wanted to be followed, their words to be followed. But they, they didn't set an example to follow. It was very much a case of do what I say, but not as I do. Now, I trust that we all recognize that that's no place to be at all. That's a shocking place to be. And what a shocking negative example the Pharisees and Jewish leaders set. But it wasn't to be like that with Titus. 
He was to show the young men what to be. And yes, and we've emphasized this, he was to preach. But he was to show them the way to go. And it's a massive challenge, isn't it? You notice the phrase uh, there, good works. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Now, we need to be careful with that phrase there, obviously. Good works is used here, of course, as a, a broad description of behavior that pleases and honors God. It's doing what God says. You've got the phraseology there in Ephesians in chapter 2. And Paul sets out the wonder of the gospel. He, he says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And there's an, a very important balance in those three verses that we've often referred to. The gospel is that we're saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, by his perfect life, by his substitutionary death, guaranteed to us then through his rising again from, from the dead. And all of uh, what belongs to us in the gospel is through Christ and what he did for us, and not through our working at all. But having said that, of course, when the gospel takes effect and brings salvation to our hearts, and when the new birth has dawned upon us, when God the Spirit has come, he changes us and molds us and makes us and remakes us. For, says Paul, here's the order, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that, that phrase, good works, I know that we can sometimes be a little shy of the word because of um, historical connotations and so on. Um, I realize that we can be shy of that uh, sort of terminology. But um, it's really speaking of... Uh, a life of behavior, of a, a pattern of living that pleases God. You've got the same terminology in that um, verse that we quoted last Sunday morning in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 5 and at verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He's not talking about apple pies there. No, it's not good works in that sense. He's talking about good works in the sense that they be the salt and light that they're intended to be, that their lives be lives that bring God glory. They glorify your Father in heaven. And that men are drawn into the gospel because of the godly lives that you live. It's again to be found in First Peter and um, in uh, chapter 2 and at verse um, 11, if I can turn this up um, quickly enough for us there. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, through um, your good works, works through a life that pleases God and that honors God and that clearly pays God tribute and accords with the truth of the gospel, others may came, come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and may glorify God on the day of visitation. Titus was to watch out for his preaching, but he was to watch out for every part of his example and his good works, his life, the life that he lived. And there's particular focus then on um, his teaching, his preaching, and his whole approach um, that the, the doctrine and the teaching that he set, sets forth brings. Notice the words that are used here. In all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, and so on. 
Notice that word integrity. Often in the New Testament with the idea of something incorruptible. That's probably where we'll most e easily recognize the word being used in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15 and in verse 54, where we read, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. It's incorruptible. It's not capable of decay. It's pure. It's sincere. The word is used again in the book of um, uh, Ephesians in chapter uh, 6, the very last verse of Ephesians. Chapter 6, verse 24. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. It's with a purity. It's with a sincerity. Um, we've got the noun being used there. In First Peter and in chapter 1 and in verse 4, we've got the same root um, word, but the adjective. And so we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. Titus's teaching was to be without any kind of corruption. His teaching was to be pure. He was to bring the word. It was to be without any kind of corruption. More, he was to come with reverence. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence. Um, Titus's preaching wasn't for amusement. He was to come with reverence. You find that word used in um, 1 Timothy in chapter 2. Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, that we may live in the revere of God, in the fear of God. And so the word has the idea of um, coming with dignity and majesty. Perhaps the idea of gravity. I'm not sure that's a word that we use so terribly much now, but perhaps the idea of gravity. Titus's teaching wasn't for amusement. You know, it, it, it wasn't the amusement arcade. He wasn't, and we've said this a number of times, um, about entertainment it was serious stuff. And that's not um, necessarily negating, um, you know, that there can be humor in bringing God's word. The Lord Jesus says, seems to say on occasion, some humorous things to, to bring home a point. Um, but the point is that the, the whole orb of the preaching and teaching was serious stuff. More the idea of indestructible um, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine showing integrity reverence incorruptibility and the the, the, the sort of sense of indestructible um, Paul writing in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 4 and in verse 16 writes therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing and he, he talks about the pressures that he was under. And it, those pressures that he um, was under because of his gospel ministry um, threatened in terms of his outward man. They were a threat to him. Um, they, they showed, they demonstrated that he was destructible. Now, the word that we've got here is that word, but with the, uh, the, 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 the A on the front. So it's indestructible. Paul's preaching was to be of a, a kind, an ilk, that was indestructible. And then um, another word, the idea of sound. And we've met that word um, already um, in, in uh, Titus chapter 1 and in chapter 2. It's the word, you've heard me say, undergirds the idea of hygienic. And in this sense, it's the idea of whole or healthy. 
in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned. This was to be sound speech, whole or healthy speech. Now, notice that all of this is in total contrast with what had been said of the false teachers at the end of chapter 1. The false teachers... Um, they deceive, for there, there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers. They deceive. They lie, verse 12. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars. Um, they, they were characterized by, you know, lies and so on. The false teachers rejected the truth, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. They were out for dishonest gain, verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. They were in it for dishonest gain. They were false teachers. They were mere talkers, verse 10 again, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers. These false teachers were out for an audience, they were out for a, a, a following, but their teaching did not accord with the truth according to godliness. But Titus is to be known for his integrity, for his gravity, for his sound speech. That's what Titus is to be known for. Dear friend, I know it's a, a very confusing day. And um, I know that in this day and age, and we've said this before, that the sound bite can, you know, be, be the crucial thing. That the, 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 the quick, the cheeky, the, the amusing word can be the, can be the thing um, by which people judge what's good and what's bad. Dear friend, be careful what you're ready to listen to. Paul here is genuinely worried. He's concerned because he recognizes that genuine Christians can be led astray by error, by false teachers, by people who seem so convincing. And sometimes uh, those who come with the, with the gospel, who stick to the, to the gospel truth, who stick to Bible truth, um, can look to be so fussy, so detailed, so involved, and so on. But the Bible is full of detail. The Bible is concerned for those different issues in our lives, isn't it? Be careful what you're ready to listen to. There can be that readiness to be taken by the light and the amusing, the pleasing. You see what Titus was being told to be careful for? To bring God's word, to set an example to all but to the young men. He's to set forth an example and to be solid. These were to be sound words. Be careful you never reject sound words. The responsibility of every Christian, the rally cry for every compliance, and then the rebuttal to every criticism. Paul seems to be very mindful of the opposition and the difficulty that Titus was likely to face in Crete. And he urges then in verse 8, that uh, Titus be full of sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. Titus is to be careful in his demeanor, in his behavior, in his life, but in his teaching. And in the way, of course, that his life and being supported and upheld his teaching, just as we saw that principle with the older men last week, that nobody be able to undermine him, but rather that bad mouths be silenced. Titus's word and example shouldn't, should you know, cause no one to deny the validity of his message. He should give them nothing to say, nothing bad to say. If in his work he was going to be lazy, or careless, or big-mouthed, or if in his life he was going to teach one thing and do another, he would soon undermine his teaching. 
but he's to give no one a reason for that. Indeed, Titus's words and godly example should render the false teachers speechless, silencing them. Now, be clear, of course, that there will always be um, trouble for someone in Titus's position. Um, people should have nothing to say. Their mouths should be shut. But let's face it, people have oftentimes had plenty to say. The classic example of that is one that we've often alluded to in Numbers and chapter 12, where it's dear Moses who was so faithful, but it's dear Moses who finds himself being criticised in other, in other places by the children of Israel, but in Numbers and chapter 12 by Miriam and by Aaron. And we read of there, and I've often read from um, chapter 12 and verse 3, we read there, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who are on the face of the earth. And they're throwing up um, criticisms of Moses. They've got things to say about Moses, but God wasn't speaking against him. They spoke against him, but God wasn't speaking against him. And so, you know, it can be that you can be godly and upright and you can be consistent and you can be a worthy example and so on and people will speak against you. They spoke against Jeremiah, didn't they? Poor old Jeremiah, what um, a hard life that man had. And he seeks to be faithful and he seeks to be true right from the outset. He, he doesn't really want the job because he knows what the people will be like. Here's Paul. And Paul himself is saying, look, live a, a life that will set forth an example and that won't allow people to speak against you. But Paul spoke against, uh, but people spoke against rather Paul. And um, here we are in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 10. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. People had things to say. Paul himself, though he says what he says here in Titus, knew plenty of opposition. But he's urging that Titus live and minister in such a way that opponents are made to feel their guilt, their wrong in doing what they're doing. Now, that doesn't guarantee that they'll be silenced, but it does set it all clearly before men, doesn't it? You see, how careful we, we need to be when we've got a good and godly example before us. And when the truth is being set before us in all sincerity and truth, as Paul is describing here, how careful we don't fly in the face of that. Because most definitely we're flying in the face of God. How careful we need to be. What are we going to say here this morning? Well, how important, notice please, that theme of self-control. If God, the Spirit, has broken into your heart, he'll want to bring you under his control. He'll want you to be self-controlled. Now, the spirit of the age is be yourself, do whatever. And if you're doing what's deep down in your heart, well, no matter, do whatever it is that you think to do. No. The Spirit of God brings a man into a place of self-control, under the control of God, the Holy Spirit. How careful to live as we say. Titus is being told here to live his life in such a way that it accords with what he says. It's to live as we say, not to do as I say can easily fall into that and it's do as I say no it's do as I live and how careful then to hear the solid sound somber gospel message that tells us that we're sinners in need of the grace and mercy of God that's the message that Titus was to bring that's the message that we need to hear that's the message that we need to receive isn't it we need the grace, we need the mercy of God. We need God's intervention, God's dealings in our lives. And we need to hear that solid sound, somber gospel message that tells us we're sinners 
and drives us into the arms of Jesus Christ. Let us turn to God in prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for the many, many opportunities that we've had, whether we be older men or older women, younger men, younger women, whatever we be, the many, many opportunities that have come to us that we hear the gospel truth, that we hear the truth of your word. Help us, Lord, we pray, to receive it and to take it in. Help us, Lord, that we may not spurn the word, but that we may receive with humble hearts the word of God, which is able to save our souls. Help all who minister the gospel in these days, that they be faithful and true and consistent, that they be loyal, they uphold your name, and that they live lives that accord, O oh God, with the teaching which, that they bring. This is our prayer of you, asking blessing as we part. In Jesus' name. Amen.